Okay. I think that we can go ahead and get started as people are rolling in. Welcome everyone to the fifth and final session of this year's virtual 2021 UNC Mini Med School. Woohoo! <laughs> if you have been with us from the beginning, thank you, you made it through. If you are just joining us tonight for the first time, welcome. We hope that you found your way to us and thank you for bearing with us as we have been navigating the fun challenges of the Zoom webinar platform. We appreciate all of your feedback and we'll incorporate that as we prepare for next year's mini med school. So if you couldn't attend um, any of the prior sessions or last week's session on the thyroid, all of our sessions have been recorded, including this session and are available on our website um, and in the past presentations tab. There you'll find also more information about our speakers. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any technical issues, um, please feel free to email us. Um, Nathan, I'm gonna ask you to place the email in the chat for everyone. If you have any technical issues, then we'll go ahead and address them there. But if you have any questions at all over the course of tonight's presentation, you can go ahead and use the Q&A box that should be available at the bottom of your screen. And we will be assisting with addressing those questions um, and also holding off answering uh, presentation related questions until the end of our speaker. If you like, you can comment and upvote on other people's questions as well. And we'll give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask your question as well um, once we get to the Q&A portion. With that, I will go ahead and introduce our student speaker for the evening. Uh, Danny Brathwaite is a UNC MD PhD sixth year student. She is currently working on her PhD in health policy and management, and her research interests uh, include mental health services and emergency department based care. Take it away, Danny. All right. Can everyone hear me? I only see thumbs up from my crew here. All right. Um, well, awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, tonight, I'm going to be speaking broadly about health equity, um, and I know that this is a topic that's a little bit different than the previous couple um, mini med school sessions. You know, it's not about a certain disease or a certain organ system, um, and so we're going to touch on this topic very broadly. Like, there's we could spend a whole semester talking about this and more, um, but I'm hoping that tonight's talk will give you, you know, some food for thought, um, some questions to continue to explore, and hopefully foster some good conversation. And so let's see, there we go. So learning objectives for today. Um, and so we're going to define health equity and how it is measured. We're going to hopefully understand the disparities that exist in health and health care, define factors that influence health access and health outcomes, and consider has we, how we as a community can work towards health equity. And so to start off with, we should probably define what health equity is. And so this definition comes straight from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, so off the CDC website. And it says health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social, social position or other socially determined circumstances. So I wanna stop there and highlight two things. The first is that the definition says, this is based on a person obtaining his or her full health potential. And so this is going to be relative to the individual person. Everyone has different health needs and thus different health potential. And so this idea of health equity is not going to be one universal standard for everyone. It's going to vary person by person, people group by people group. And so we can't just have one definition for every single person. The second thing I want to highlight is that it says that these are based on socially determined circumstances. There is a social framework that we have to understand when thinking about health equity. It's more than just an individual person and their biology, but their entire social environment. And so we'll dive into that a little bit more as well. And then the second part here says health inequities are reflected in differences in length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability and death, severity of disease and access to treatment. And so what we would consider these are health outcomes. These are the ways that we measure health equity because we can't really put a measurement on whether or not someone achieves their full health potential. 
Instead, we measure these outcomes that we see further down the road. And so we'll talk a little bit more about these outcomes that we look at when assessing health equity. And so maybe you have seen this picture before. I really like this picture as a visual way of, again, thinking about the difference between the word equality and the world word equity. When we think about equity, like I said before, it's personalized. It's specific to the health needs of an individual person. So on the right-hand side of this picture, you see in order to get everyone looking at the baseball game at the same level, everyone requires a different number of boxes or a different need. And so equity is essentially making sure that the needs that we're providing for are tailored to the people that actually need them. Another practical example would be a storefront or trying to access the door to a store establishment. Some person, some people might need a set of stairs with a handrail and that will meet their health needs. Another set of people might need a walking ramp or a wheelchair ramp to meet their health needs, both with the goal of getting into the store, but the health needs are different. And so they have to be met in different ways in order to achieve equity. So then the second part of that definition that I mentioned were these social determinants. Maybe you've heard this term before, the social determinants of health. And so I pulled this definition from the Kaiser Family Foundation, another organization that I really love, and you'll see a lot of their stuff in this presentation. Um, but they describe the social determinants of health as social determinants are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. They include factors like socioeconomic status, education, neighborhood and physical environment, employment, and social support networks, as well as access to health care. So there's a lot in there. So another way we could think about it, and I don't know about you guys, but I'm a very visual person. And so I wanted to pull up this picture and there's a lot going on in this picture, but you can see within the picture, all of these different pieces of the social determinants of health. In this picture, you see that there's a park, there's green space for people to walk. There's a playground, there's a biking path or a walking trail. There's an access to a pharmacy as well as food. There's public transportation for people to get around and that there's people of all different ages and backgrounds and different abilities and stages of life all in the same environment. And so this is just another visual way to think about all of these different social factors, environmental factors that go into considering how people are able to access and provide for their own health and health care. Another way that uses words right off of the Kaiser Family Foundation is this one. And this actually breaks down the social determinants into these six different categories, whether on economic stability, such as someone's employment or income, their built environment, do they have safe housing, access to transportation, are they able to walk outside or go outside in their neighborhood? Their education, how far, how far along did they get? Do they have um, language barriers or literacy barriers? Do they have any food insecurity? What is their community and social context like? Do they have social support systems in place? And then what is the healthcare system like in their environment? Do they have a primary care provider or are there no providers available? And what is the quality of the care they can get? And so many of these things, may seem like common sense, but sometimes they're really hard to measure. You know, it's really hard to understand or actually even quantify someone's level of hunger or safety of their housing. So instead of trying to measure all of these different factors, we look at those health outcomes at the bottom, morbidity, mortality, life expectancy. We measure those in order to assess the impacts of these social determinants. And so the last definition I wanna throw at you guys before we dive into um, some more practical stuff is health disparities. So when we think about inequity or a problem with health equity, we think about health disparities. And these disparities are defined as differences in health and health care between groups that are closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantage with many of the factors we just talked about. And disparities occur across many dimensions, including race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, location, geography, gender, disability status, and sexual orientation. And so you'll see throughout the talk today, we're not just gonna be talking about race or income, but some of these other strata as well. And so here are a few different disparities I wanna highlight. This is by no means an extensive list, um, but just for today's talk and for the sake of time, I wanted to highlight a few of these kind of just to run the spectrum of different things. Um, feel free to ask questions afterwards if there are other areas of health that you're interested in learning more about disparities that exist, and I'll certainly try my best to answer them. There are a lot of graphs coming up. I will orient you to every graph that I show, so hopefully nothing is too confusing. But I wanted to start talking about healthcare access, right? That's kind of the crux of health equity. Can people actually access healthcare services? And when we think about accessing healthcare services, we have to start with insurance. 
do people actually have insurance or the ability to pay or fund healthcare services? And so what this graph is looking at, this is again from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and they're looking at the uninsured rate for the non-elderly population from 2010 to 2018. And so you see time along the x-axis there going from left to right. And then this is the percentage of people that are uninsured by um, specific racial groups. And so just to define some of the acronyms on the right-hand side there, um, the top one, AIAN, is a American Indian and Alaskan Native. And then NHOPI down here is Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. So a couple of things I want you to take away from this graph. The first is that there is a clear racial divide in the percent of uninsured individuals. Ideally, we want the uninsured rate to be extremely low. We want people to have, like, have insurance, be able to afford their health care. But we see that certain racial groups, especially American Indians, Hispanics, and Blacks, have much higher rates of uninsurance compared to some of their peers. Along with that, this has been consistent over time. We, say, we see the same stacking of the different racial groups all the way across. Now you do see a dip and this dip is good and this dip is right around here. And for those who keep up with health policy, this is right about when the Affordable Care Act kicked in and we see this plummet in the uninsured rate, which is good. Policy can have a great impact on these things. But at the same time, despite all of these rates going down and us getting more people on insurance, we still see these disparities between different racial groups. Another way we can look at it is based on poverty level. And so what you're looking at here is again, the, uh, the uninsured rate, but we're looking at the change in the uninsured rate. So whether it went up or down. And so breaking this down by poverty level over here on the left-hand side, this is percent of the federal poverty line. So right here, this is less than 100% of the federal poverty line, poverty line going to 400%. So this is the poorest group going from left to right. And what you see is that the people at a poorer income level actually saw an increase in the uninsured rate during this time, a significant increase, that's our little asterisk there indicates, as compared to our group that was above the federal poverty line. Again, you see these same trends when we break it down by race and ethnicity. Certain minority populations saw an increase in the uninsured rate, whereas other ones actually saw a decrease. And so whereas by race, we might see something positive happen, we still see other disparities happening in terms of income. And so I bring this up just so that we're not just thinking about race as the only disparity, but we're also thinking about socioeconomic status. And we'll touch on some other ones as we go through. So what about actually getting care? So we see these same disparities and you'll get this, the trend is gonna be the same as we go through these different examples, but we see these same disparities when it comes to actually accessing healthcare. So on the left-hand side, we're asking whether or not someone chose not to see a doctor due to cost. And again, the asterisk means a significant, um, statistically significant difference from the white population, which they use as the reference group here. And so for Black, Hispanic, actually all racial groups here have an asterisk, as well as almost over here with the exception of two, but they significantly had a higher proportion of choosing not to see a doctor due to cost when compared to their white counterparts. And then they also have instances of delaying care, not just choosing not to see care, but waiting longer than they should to actually seek health care. And you again see these statistically significant increases in minority racial groups. So I'm going to transition a little bit again. So we talked about health care utilization and insurance. Another example I wanted to give that's actually a really, really important one is maternal mortality. This is something where we see drastic differences um, and health outcomes when it comes to racial divide as well as other um, disparity strata that we'll talk about. So just to start off with, what you're looking at here is the proportion um, uh, or the maternal mortality, so the proportion of deaths per 100,000 live births broken down by racial groups. And you can see that non-Hispanic Black women have a rate of maternal mortality that is significantly higher when compared to their white and Hispanic counterparts. We can break this down a little bit further by looking over time. You might think, okay, well, maybe it got better over time. Maybe things are at least moving in a positive direction. But we actually see, and here, if we look at the different colors, um, the dark blue is Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaskan Native, this is black, the purple is black, and then we have white over here. We see that that rate is highest among black women across time. So African-American women have been struggling with this consistently over time. The trends haven't been changing enough to get rid of that disparity. Another thing we could look at is by age. 
So what this graph is showing is again, the same racial groups, but they're looking um, over the age of mom. So going from less than 20 years all the way up to greater than 40 years of age at the time of birth. And what you can see is that the first thing I want you to take away is that dark purple line, which represents African-American moms, is the top line, almost regardless of age. You have a little bit of crossover here with our other population, American Indian and Alaskan Natives, that are also struggling with this disparity. But African-American women are consistently at higher risk across the, the age course here. But the other thing that's important to note is that at greater than 40 years of age, that disparity shoots up. And so the disparity itself is much higher at older ages. Now, part of this is because having going through pregnancy at an older age puts you at risk to begin with. And so what we see is the disparity actually compounds on itself over time as mothers get older, as they have babies. And so there's this age factor on top of the racial factor that's also creating a disparity. And I mentioned we would talk even more about that. So let's look at education level. The PRMR here is the pregnancy related mortality ratio. That's what they're referencing. And for that measure for black women with at least a college degree was still five times as high as white women with similar education. So even if we're looking at just individuals who had a college degree or higher, there is still a huge disparity in the maternal mortality for those individuals by race. And so even with education in the equation, we're still seeing this disparity. And of course, this disparity holds across each of the education groups that we're seeing here. And of course, maternal mortality transfers over to infant mortality. We see disparities in infant mortality as well among these different racial groups as compared to their white counterparts. And so these are rates per 1,000 live births, but you see very similar instances where African-American groups as well as American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and Pacific Islanders are having much higher rates of infant mortality in the US. So now I'm gonna to transition to a different topic again. So now we're looking at childhood obesity. And again, similar trends, you guys already know what I'm going to say, but this is looking at the prevalence of obesity among youth in the US by different racial groups. And it splits it by gender, boys versus girls on this graph. But essentially the different colors represent the different groups with the darkest blue being non-Hispanic white. And the key takeaway here is that the highest groups, these non-Hispanic black and then Hispanic groups, this lighter paler blue and the lighter paler green are consistently higher than their white counterparts or their non-Hispanic Asian counterparts. And so there's a huge disparity even starting in childhood. And I bring this up because these disparities, like I said, compound on each other. So when you see disparities in childhood, you're gonna see these same disparities grow into other things later in life. So if we look at diabetes by racial or ethnic groups and we break it down, we actually again see that American Indian or Alaskan Natives and Hispanics and Black non-Hispanics have the highest prevalence or proportion of people with diabetes in the US. Now you might ask, oh, well, American Indian and Alaskan Native wasn't on the last graph. If I go back one, they actually aren't a category here. And this is just an aside that I've noticed as I've gone through this research, but it's very difficult to actually even understand some disparities when they're not being measured. And American Indian and Alaskan Native populations are one of these groups where we don't have as much data on them because we're not actually asking that question or they're not being um, surveyed as prevalent as some of the other racial groups. And so we can't even really understand some of the disparities in their health outcomes when they're not even part of the equation, they're not even on this graph. So I wanted to bring that up because that is one of the other things we have to work towards when we think about how can we better understand what disparities exist and how we can make them better. And of course, I mentioned diabetes, um, but this is also by education level. So again, bringing in this idea of education, you see that there's a higher proportion of diabetes among individuals who have less than a high school education. So a few trends that we've seen so far, just to summarize, we see higher rates of certain chronic diseases and morbidity outcomes among ethnic and racial minorities, individuals who have lower education, educational attainment, um, as well as different differences over time that they're compounding on each other. And then I also wanted to mention heart disease. Again, this should come as no surprise if you've been uh, following the trends that we've been looking at on other different, um, different uh, diseased outcomes. But for heart disease by race, we see that black non-Hispanic individuals consistently over time, because time is on the x-axis here, consistently have had higher deaths per 100,000 persons as a result of heart disease. And heart disease is the leading killer in the US. And so 
there are racial disparities in our top reasons for death in the US. And these disparities are consistent over time. Even though we see this decrease and the decrease is good, the disparities are very clear between the different racial groups. And so we can't just decrease the overall mortality. We also have to decrease the disparity. And then if we look at cardiovascular disease, we can also look at the risk factors, the factors that lead eventually to that mortality. And so when we look at hypertension or high blood pressure, as well as obesity, we see minority populations, again, having higher rates of these risk factors that might lead to mortality down the road. So again, this idea of disparities compounding on each other over the life course. And so then last but not least, in terms of examples, I wanted to talk about COVID because it is very relevant. And so what you're looking at here, this is data from the CDC, um, but this is just the sheer um, prevalence of COVID cases per age group. And we see that the highest case number is among white non-Hispanic individuals, which makes sense based on the general breakdown of the population of the US. But I want you to keep this graph in mind based on the different um, prevalence counts. And I'll show you the next one, which is again, data from the CDC looking at age-adjusted COVID-associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity. And it's very striking to me that the highest rates of hospitalization are among Hispanic, American Indian and Alaskan Native and Black populations compared to their white counterparts, almost three times as high when we saw that the prevalence was so much higher, almost over half of the cases among the white population. And so we see this disparity in severity of COVID and the need for hospitalization when looking at minority populations. And I don't know if many of you have seen in the news, I think it just like last week, they kind of announced it, but that COVID had decreased the overall life expectancy in the US. But what's really interesting is that this picture is actually right from the journal article that was published about the life expectancy change. Um, and I found it really interesting because they broke it down by race. So let me orient you to this, um, this chart here. And so they have two different dots. The orange dot is what the life expectancy would have been without COVID. The blue dot is the life expectancy with COVID. And so if you look at the total population, this is where they get that one year number. And so just look at the left-hand side because we're gonna look at life expectancy at birth. But you see, you go from 78 years to 77 years due to COVID. There's that one year decrease in life expectancy that all the news articles blew up about. But if you break it down by race and we look at the Latino population and the black population, we're talking about three years, two years, well more than what we're seeing here. So really for certain populations, COVID is decreasing the life expectancy by multiple years, not just one. And so the story changes when you break it down by different racial groups. And again, this is just another example of a disparity that exists. If you look at this little bar for the white groups compared to the other two groups, there's a more of a story to be told there. And so again, this is just to emphasize that we have to think about different social strata, race, ethnicity, age, income, education, whenever we look at different health outcomes, because there's more to the story. These total population numbers that we generally see in news articles or you know, on headlines, that's you know, the umbrella, that's everything combined, but there's so much more if we break it down. And so take home points from that section, Again, disparities exist across all of these different social strata that we've talked about. They exist across all types of diseases from infectious to chronic, and they exist across the life course and compound over time. So, okay, all these different disparities exist, but what do we do to them? How do we get to health equity? How do we get everyone on the same playing field? And so this infographic is from the CDC again, and I actually really liked it because it breaks it down into three different pathways, programs, measurement and policy. So I wanted to start talking with measurement because we touched on this a little bit. How we measure these health outcomes, how well we're able to measure those social determinants of health, how we're able to quantify those things and understand their trends over time, that's gonna change the game on how we're able to actually identify what we need to target. And so a few simple things that I've mentioned before, including American Indian and Alaskan Native populations in more of our surveys, understanding what's happening with them. There's a lack of data in that population that we're just missing an opportunity with. That could be a way that we can improve how we measure things. Maybe we can find a really good way to actually measure what someone's health potential is. I'm not really sure, but if we can measure things better, we can address them better. The other one I wanna talk about is the policy arm there. You've heard me mention a couple of times about the Affordable Care Act. And if we think about those social, social difficulties, the social determinants of health we talked about, improving access to insurance, 
improving um, access to Medicaid, improving um, the ability of providers to actually integrate mental health care, behavioral health care, and having essential coverage of certain services, improving maternity care. The ACA actually helped with a lot of those things at the federal level. And so policy itself can actually move the needle on some of these things. And the last road is programs. When they talk about programs here, this is more local on the ground things that we can do to actually improve health equity in our communities. And so I wanted to give you guys a few examples of a couple of programs I've come across that have to deal with some of the disparities we've talked about that could serve maybe as inspiration or kind of give you a picture of what those programs could look like. And so I spent a lot of time on maternal mortality. And so I wanted to talk about community-based birth centers. There are a number of these across the US. One that I've heard a lot about is Mama Toto Village in Washington, DC. It's a community-based nonprofit and it provides perinatal clinical services all the way through pregnancy and lactation. But the really cool thing is that they actually train community health workers. So these are people in the community that they train to provide medical care as well as perform home visits and care coordination. So this is not just going to see a provider. This is making sure that your social needs are met, that you are actually given the knowledge as a patient to understand what you need every step of your birthing process. And it's being done by people in your community who understand your social environment, your social network, your city, your town. And so they're able to actually do this in a way where they're able to serve um, their patients in their community. And they've had fantastic outcomes in terms of successful births, healthy birth weights, moms who are breastfeeding. And so with this model, they've been able to serve moms in Washington, DC. And I, I, if you're interested in this model, I have links to a few other um, community-based birth centers across the country that have used very similar models. But what you'll see is that a lot of these programs are community-based. They're, they're really rooted in their community because like we said, that social network, those social needs are so important to solving this problem. Another thing that I wanted to bring up, because I mentioned childhood obesity and this American Indian Alaskan Native population is Tribal Turning Point, which is a program um, that's in part partnered through UNC. Um, the picture here is Dr. Beth Meyer Davis, who's the chair of the UNC Nutrition Department, who is part of this team. And Tribal Turning Point was a program aimed at targeting childhood obesity among tribal populations and preventing diabetes as one of those long-term outcomes, right? We talked about disparities compounding on each other. And so this was really cool. They targeted primary school age youth and they led these group classes in which the kids were, they ate a group meal together, they did physical activity together, they earned wellness bucks to encourage them to continue healthy habits. They did motivational interviewing sessions. They made a resource toolbox for these coaches. And the cool thing is that coaches were members of the tribe. So again, taking people in the community and integrating them into the actual program so that it's sustainable and rooted in the right environment. And so one of the themes you may have heard from some of these programs is that they're very community-based. And so I wanted to bring up this thing or this thing called Community-Based Participatory Research or CBPR. You may have heard of it very broadly. CBPR is meant to design programs and interventions to target these health outcomes and improve health equity in a way that um, integrates the community. And so I thought this was a really cool diagram, but you can see that um, researchers will find what they call stakeholders. Stakeholders in a community might be people of importance. So maybe it's local church leaders, maybe it's um, you know if nurses, maybe it's farm workers, whatever they're trying to target. They're going to find the key stakeholders. Who are the leaders in this area in the community? Who are people looking to? And get them in a room and sit them down and really try and understand what's happening in this community and what's important to this community. And in good CBPR, every single step of the way, these community stakeholders are involved. You know, the researchers sit down with them at the beginning. They consult with them and ask for their feedback on the process. They involve them in designing the program and implementing it. They collaborate them with them in order to sustain the program over time, and they share leadership with them. There is so much power in having community leaders that are backing these programs in order to make them work. And it makes a big difference from researchers who are coming from outside the community who don't understand that social network that's so important. And so I bring this up because if you're looking for a way to make a difference, get involved, looking for ways to be involved in your community and leadership positions that might partner with programs that are, gain, that are aimed at addressing health equity might be a potential option. And so I kind of wanted to end on this. Um, I 
didn't really get these next steps from anywhere. I kind of came up with them, but I, they all used the letter I, so I thought they were helpful. But I said, inform, involve, and influence. And here's what I mean by that. I know lots of people address health equity and they're like, what can I do? Where do I go from here? It's good that I understand this, but how do I actually make a difference? And so inform, I like the idea of informing. Maybe you just wanna learn more. Maybe it's getting more knowledge. Like I said, I really like the Kaiser Family Foundation. They have a really cool um, like email listserv that blasts like health news to your inbox. If you Google Kaiser Health News, you can sign up for their, for their emails and every morning you'll just get a, a top hits of all of the different health news. It's a great way as like someone who might not wanna read journal articles and really in-depth um, you know, research literature to still under, understand what's kind of like the top news in healthcare right now. And so I found that really digestible and I definitely recommend that. But it can also be reading books. It can be a variety of different things, getting a group of people together to talk. Um, in terms of involve, I've mentioned getting involved in research. Um, one of the other biggest things when it comes to involvement is that we talked about measurement as one of the roads to health equity. It's really hard to measure certain health outcomes when certain populations are hard to reach. You'll hear that in certain clinical trials or um, even things like when they were testing the COVID vaccine, they really wanted to make sure that they're getting people or participants in their trials from all different racial groups and backgrounds and age backgrounds and demographic backgrounds, because we can't understand how medications, diseases, or health outcomes work if we aren't able to actually study people from diverse backgrounds. And so that's something that researchers really struggle with um, is actually recruiting and understanding these different disease states in different um, diverse groups. And so that's another way to get involved. We talked about community-based participatory research and then influence. And I say influence because everyone comes from a different social sphere of influence. And this picture I have over here, um, a friend of mine sent it to me very early on in the pandemic when there was a lot of discussion about racial tension in our country. And I really liked it because what it talks about is this idea of mapping our roles in social change and the concept that, um, that everyone has a different role to play. So maybe your role is more communicating to other people. Maybe you are a guide, maybe you're a storyteller, maybe you're a healer, your job is to just to provide medical care. Maybe you're a builder or a visionary, you have a program you want to implement. And it's okay to not be all of these things. It's okay to figure out what your role is in addressing health equity um, and figuring out where you can play your part and what sphere of influence you have. And so I kind of wanted to leave you guys on that. Um, and kind of open the floor for questions from there. Um, and I also have my email address here. I don't know how long we want to chat tonight, um, but you are totally free to email me with additional questions. I'll just put that out there. Um, but that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danny, for that overview and for the helpful resources. Um, it was really, really wonderful presentation. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have some time since we just have our student speaker. Um, oh, it looks like Diane McGrath raised her hand. Um, Kevin, would you like to give Diane the opportunity to unmute? Okay, Diane, feel free to unmute yourself. Sorry, thank you. I, I'm excited uh, to see you list the uh, training community health workers uh, in, a, in a community. Um, I, I will give you a little history. Dr. Eva Selber at Duke in Community and Family Medicine, this is in the 70s, and her husband, Dr. Harry Phillips, was at the UNC School of Public Health. Dr. Salber, Dr. Eva Salber actually developed one of the first models for developing uh, community health providers. And some of the students from the School of Public Health um, were involved. And what they did in Durham was go to neighborhoods and in the poorer uh, areas, like in the Bahama area and other parts of Durham, 
and and just meet people like on their front porch or something and started with the question when you don't feel so good who who do you talk to in here and sometimes it might be a nurse it might be a pharmacist it might be a trusted neighbor and what they did was gather that information and then they call those people together develop training programs um, it was at a time when they were using kerosene for coughs <laughs> that probably <laughs> blows your mind but it happened um, and it still happens um, but I, I think it might be worth your time to, um, I, I don't know where this is written up. I, I mean, I, that was in the, in the 70s and I was in a different area in the same department with Dr. Uh, Selber. Um, but it might be worth your effort to see if you can explore uh, the background and what that model was and developed. It was very effective. Wow, thank you for sharing. That's really, really cool. I, um, I have a friend who did, for his doctoral dissertation, did work with African-American men in Durham, asking them about you know, where they seek healthcare. Um, also because African-American men have one of the lowest rates of healthcare utilization. Yeah. And so he was asking, you know, how they access healthcare. Do they feel safe? Even asking, like, how do you feel about the police and things like that? And um, given the day and age we live in, he actually used social media to recruit them. He actually did like a bunch of Instagram advertising and um, managed to recruit them that way and actually did like really in-depth interviews with them just to get to know what their experience is like in their own community. And so it's similar, but like, you know, using different technology, but really just getting in the right space and asking people like, what are your experiences? I, I, I would add that it's very important to talk the language of the people. Mm. Um, I remember one time telling medical students that, and you know, if they say taking a crap or peeing or whatever phrase, you use their language and, and they took me to task for that. Um, you know, we're professionals. Well, if you're a professional, learn how to communicate with real people. <laughs> yeah, I learned what a done fell out meant when I moved down here. It's like I had a number of patients who just done fell out. But yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Diane, for that history and uh, suggestion. It's cool to learn a little bit more about um, some of the efforts that led up to where we are today. So thank you so much. Um, oh, Don, Donna had asked, what does done fell out, fell out mean, I assume? Uh, for yeah, what does so that mean? In medical terms, you would call it syncope or like passed out. Um, so usually someone like fell, like literally just fell um, unconscious for a second. Like, you know, when you, uh, like what we call it vasobagal or, or syncope where you feel like you're about to pass out for, for a moment or you might actually do so. Yeah, and usually you're back up in like 30 seconds. Yes, thank you, Danny, for clarifying. We have another question from Xiaobin. Um, Kevin, could you help us unmute Xiaobin? Hi. Thank you for uh, this session. Um, I want to ask, how much do you think that um, immigration statuses can influence measurement? Like for example, like the hinder surveys, number of recorded answers, and how do you think it influences interpretations of the results? Yes, that is a great question. Um, I did not put the graph in here, but Kaiser Family Foundation actually did have another breakdown based on um, in, like uh, legal status for these different racial groups and some of the other outcomes they were looking at. But 100%, there is um, a huge portion of our population that is not counted in these numbers. So again, when we think about um, improving measurement to actually work on health equity, that's a big portion of it. We don't count everyone who actually resides in the US um, at all. So I think it does have a huge role to play. Um, along with that, our incarcerated population is also not well counted and not well accounted for in these numbers as well. So there are people that are just missing from the conversation completely. Wow, okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Any other questions as we're wrapping up our session and our series tonight? Give a moment. Um, if you think of anything, feel free to uh, place your question or raise your hand um, uh, in the, you know, raise your hand or place a question in the Q&A box. But um, if we don't have any other questions, oh, we do, Daria. <laughs> All right, let's uh, unmute Daria. <laughs> I hope I'm saying your name right. Please correct me if I'm not. Uh, yeah, you are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, adding on to the last question that was asked, um, I've heard that, for example, for kidney dialysis, especially it's a huge problem uh, how, uh, for, for example, undocumented individuals or those who may not have direct access to healthcare would just kind of put off going to the doctor, even if there's a ton of problems. So how do you kind of improve that social inequity yeah that's a difficult one um i have a really good friend who is a medical student elsewhere who actually is an undocumented immigrant and i remember him having a hard time even applying to medical school but what he told me through his own research was that there is such a huge trust barrier like they like a lot of the populations he worked with trusted him because he was also undocumented but even then there's such, there's such a level of fear for interacting with the healthcare system in any way that could identify them as undocumented. Even applying for um, like community care or like other services to help them pay, they would be worried that that might reveal their documentation status. Um, and so it's, it's a huge problem to tackle. The first thing I could think of is really just in terms of access to services is, is more free clinics. Um, but there's also that social culture that has to be addressed and really involving community leaders who can vouch on our behalf, right? If we wanna open a free clinic coming from us, there's still gonna be that level of fear that we can't break down and we're really gonna to have to partner or find people who can really bridge that gap and be a liaison between us and these communities if we want to. Um, and I can't think off the top of my head of any like fantastic models or examples, but I could certainly like look and try and see, but that's, that, those are my thoughts at this point. Thank you. All right. Again, if you have any last minute questions while we're wrapping up, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, we're, we're kind of nearing the end now. So I do wanna thank all of our attendees uh, especially if anyone needs to head out for, for joining us tonight. We wouldn't have a mini med school without our students and without our curious and engaged community members. So we really appreciate your presence tonight and throughout the last five weeks. Thank you as well to, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I miss having a real uh, applause, but we, we do what we can with Zoom. Thank you to our student speaker, Danny, for your time preparing your presentation and answering the Q&A questions. Um, shout out as well to our panelists uh, for their, their technical support and for all of the other students um, on the mini med school committee for pulling this off. This is the second year that we've done mini med school and the first year that we've done it virtually. And we know that there are always things that we can do to improve. So we will be sending a final um, survey tomorrow. And again, really, really appreciate your feedback um, to help us improve our program and choose topics for the coming years. Additionally, in the next few weeks, all attendees will receive a digital certificate for your participation. And that will be sent to the same email address used to register for the Zoom webinar and it will reflect any and all of the sessions you were able to attend in 2021. Additionally, a quick plug. Um, oh, I guess I think Nathan's going to share in the chat. Um, but just to direct your attention, a quick plug again for our website, where you can find any of the talks that have been presented by UNC Mini Med School, including we didn't record last year's sessions, but we have PowerPoint uh, files for the presentation. So you can look through those PowerPoints um, from last year, as well as the PowerPoints and recorded sessions from this year at med.unc.edu slash mini med school. Also, if you have Twitter um, and are interested in learning more about next year's mini med school, please follow the UNC MD PhD Twitter account, which is 
at UNC MD PhD. We will update you about mini med school next year. And also you can hear about other fun things that uh, the UNC MD PhD program is doing. So with that, just want to say, stay safe, everyone. We hope you learned something new tonight in these past few weeks. And we really appreciate your participation and wish you all a great night and a wonderful rest of your year. Take care.